Well, good morning, everybody. And whilst the year is coming to an end, we can finish it, I think, on a very interesting and exciting note. Today's masterclass is out, actually about creating a culture of innovation. It's the last webinar that we're doing this year, which is the fourth in a series. This series is actually being part of the federal government here in Australia's Smart Cities and Suburbs program. So the Smitty Leadership Institute has conducted workshops and masterclasses and webinars such as the one today across the country, filled with different people from um, Perth, Melbourne, Brisbane, uh, Canberra and a whole range of things. But they're all urban leaders and they're all focused on building great communities um, across the country. But one thing that we do know is that if you actually have a smart city, it has to be thinking smart as well as being smart. And it's the culture within the organisation, within the council, just as much as the culture within the community that's important. We know that there's ever-changing needs and there's plenty of ideas that generate both within organisations and outside of their organisations. So what we're focusing on today is both of those two sides. How can you create a culture of innovation within your organisation and how you can create a culture of innovation in the community? And Professor Blakely is here with us as well. And I think you might like to have a say at the beginning about the culture of innovation. You've worked with plenty of organisations. Well, I think the, uh, the idea here is not just innovation, but entrepreneurship. Civic on entrepreneurship is really under play. Leaders in civic space tend to be adverse to taking risk. And we don't want to be adverse to taking risk. We want to take really smart risk. And you do that by using smart tools, by using systems, and not by just throwing things on the wall. So we're really talking about an entrepreneurial culture that we've seen in some cities, particularly in places like Palo Alto, California, and even here in Newcastle. Let's unleash the potential of all the civic leaders and all the people in every community to contribute to making a place a better place to live and work. Thanks, Ed. And today is um, a great day in the sense that we also have a presenter with us. And Johanna Pittman is someone who I think you've been working for a long time in different capacities um, with different people in different cities. But right now, working with Blue Chile, which is an organisation which tries to bring people with, with great ideas, with great investors, and start connecting the dots and building those capacity of startups and entrepreneurs, as you said, Ed, so that they can actually bring that idea, develop that idea and bring it to fruition. And so it's one of the um, pleasures I have today. I know, Johanna, you've been um, travelling and working pretty hard this year, but I'll hand it over to you to maybe give us some insights from your perspective, um, having worked with Sydney City, I know in particular, but others around the country, of how we can go about creating that culture of innovation. Great. Thank you, Catherine and Ed, and delighted to be here. It's a topic I'm really um, passionate about and um, as you said, um, I've been with Blue Chile since the beginning of 2017 and if one thing's more clear than anything, it's that culture and um, the what human behaviour is what makes or breaks a smart city and it really is such an important part of the um, our understanding of how urban innovation happens. So I'd love to... Um, I've, I've prepared a few notes and tried to put it all together, but basically where I'm coming from is as someone who has spent um, many years in state government, in federal government and working with local governments, the transition for me personally to a startup in incubator accelerator has been very exciting. And mostly because as an employee, the culture in the organization is vastly different to anything I've ever, ever experienced before because this culture of innovation is in the DNA of every single person that um, works here. And what that means and, that, and how that then feeds on itself is really critical. And so I guess reflecting on uh, what our startups do, and they're the startups that I'm working with that uh, sell into government, um, and have great ideas to disrupt the way that um, services are currently uh, delivered is how do we infuse some of that culture of innovation in other organisations? So I'll just uh, go onto a full screen here if that's um, coming across. So, so 
yeah, I guess just to kick off, one of the first things to note is obviously we're all aware of the pressures that are leading to why we need a culture of innovation. And there are so many. This is just a selection of some of them. It could have been much uh, a much longer list. Um, but I, I see these six as, as things that really mean that we can't go on delivering um, and thinking in the ways that we have in the past, particularly the rapid tech cycles. That's something that we're, um, we're seeing all the time. But what it means is as the tech, um, the technology accumulates upon itself. So either you leapfrog some of the old innovations or you need to really stay ahead of the game. And one of the things that comes to mind for me is as an example, if people are, let's say, moving into a apartment building in five years time, they will expect that there is electric vehicle charging stations within that vehicle. They, there will not be a sort of, I wonder if there is, it will be an expectation that if it is a new building, that is a standard. And yet these rapid tech cycles, that sounds very sort of easy and why didn't someone think of it? But from a council perspective or from those that are involved in, the, in making the regulations, there's a lot of thinking that needs to go into that. So how do we adapt to these rapid tech cycles and enable things to be um, to enable the regulations to keep pace and 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 to know how to respond. The um, increased density, rising inequality, the increase of services required that the, the rising inequality brings. An important one I think here to focus on would be the gig economy. I think that reduces the predictability of what our citizens are doing on a day-to-day -day basis and how they, how, when, where they travel to work, to play, to, to study. Um, it's really changing um, the predictability of, uh, of citizen movements. For the 30-minute city, it, it's incredibly critical that we've come to understand that we need jobs closer to home, but how is that possible? And that's where, as Ed mentioned, a culture of entrepreneurship means that the same thinking that is infused through our uh, government organisations also enables people to be entrepreneurs and to take that great knowledge they have of public service and actually develop um, jobs, their own, their own businesses, and that that doesn't, that becomes the norm, that's not the exception. And the final one here would be around the high expectations. Citizens are used to using Uber, Airbnb, um, uh, using uh, commenting on things in the public domain and, you know, whether it be something commercial, but then they'll also expect that they can comment on stuff in, um, in that uh, government pro provides as well. So they expect fast service and they expect that they can comment on what is going on and if they can't if they don't have a platform on which to comment they will create their own platform and so these six things combined and there are surely many others certainly mean that a culture of innovation can't come soon enough and on an organizational level there are three more areas in which it matters obviously we've all been subject to efficiency dividends and trying to work within constrained budgets but this really means that um, thinking about things differently, taking advantage of solutions that are costing less than they've ever cost before. And a lot of the technology and software as a service has meant the costs have dropped dramatically. And it's also possible that something that was um, pioneered or piloted in another city can be adopted relatively quickly and cheaply because of the, um, the, um, the reduced costs. And the third one, why it matters more than ever is really important, I think, as we think about uh, the ageing uh, workforce, particularly within the public sector, talent attraction and retention is critical. And nobody joins an organisation because they say it's got great processes and we love the processes and I just want to work in an organisation with great processes. And in fact, for millennials, the factors that will attract them to an organisation are also the same factors that will keep them there and in and uh, that will keep them there and allow them to um, and encourage them to uh, share inf share information, have inclusiveness. These are all factors for innovation itself. So, organisational cultures 
need to embrace that culture of innovation because that's what's going to attract and retain talent as well. So if these are all the reasons why it matters, what's holding us back? And I think these are fairly um, expected. There's probably lots of other reasons, but certainly there is a culture of risk aversion and, and that um, and that's understandable. There's taxpayers' money at, at risk and, and there's an um, incredible scrutiny of what uh, governments are doing. And so it, that's natural. And I think, you know, I'm not going to challenge all of these because I think in, to a certain extent there are things that we can change and there's things that we, um, which are more difficult. I say here transparency and in inverted commas because I really do believe that there, there is a demand and a need to be transparent. But there's also an aspect within our organisations and large organisations, government or large corporates, where we hide behind processes if, we, if we're uncomfortable about doing something. And so transparency can be a way that we sort of say, well, I'm not sure, why don't we just create a procurement process and then we'll, then we'll see which organisation is best. Well, is that the best way to go? So the the processes provide an opportunity for to take a step back and certainly can slow down this um, the, the adoption of innovative ideas and organizational silos uh, large corporates again as well as government agencies it's almost like it's embedded in the um, operating manual at that this the it's very difficult to build co collaboration across organisational, let alone with, with other organisations. And so if we think about organisational silos, um, and as I reflect on the number of restructures um, I experienced in public sector, it was usually once the silos got so embedded, they said, well, you know, we'll fix this, we'll have a restructure. This is, this is not uh, embedding a culture of innovation. And one of the things, and I thought this was an interesting um, uh, statement around it's both the use of technology within each of the organized parts of an organization and the processes that wrap around it that are going to that are going to embed innovation so you can have great things going on in certain parts of the organization but if there are not structured processes to share that innovation across an organization then it, then it's certainly going to be uh, under leveraged there's one more thing that I believe is holding us back and, and in software terminology, they might talk about this as waterfall processes, but certainly um, the linear processes that we undertake in government are certainly um, embedded in the way we think about things. If we think about any procurement process, any project, any um, way in which we, had, we start uh, anything, it's about analyze the problem, outline the options, determine the solution, and then implement the actions. And in many ways, this is a safe way to go about it. You can always point back to the earlier, um, earlier uh, steps and say, I've followed all the steps. And again, I've got that transparency there of the process. But when technology and the circumstances in which we operate are changing so quickly, this linear process does not allow for iteration. And if the problem changes over the course, and if we think about most projects are at least a year, two years long, the, if the problem changes, if the nature of the problem changes, then it, it's certainly going to uh, mean that the solution is no longer relevant. I just don't know why that's happening. So what this, where this gets us to is that in many ways, these linear processes are sort of designed to minimize the risk of failure, but in many ways, they actually make change the enemy and they make flexibility and nimbleness really difficult to achieve. And this is a quote by uh, Australia Post had a really interesting conference earlier this year. And uh, a couple of quotes in here are from there because it was very much talking about the culture of innovation. Which leads me to a kind of key point, and particularly when we think about smart cities, we know that we know that it's uh, not about 
the technology that we've moved from smart cities 1.0 to 2.0 and we're aiming for 3.0 and that it's beyond the technology but it's also within the organizations as well in order to have an innovative organization it's not about the adoption of uh, different technologies but it really is about the people and technology and enabling people to see the different possibilities that will make that possible so it all seems a, probably a bit doom and gloom but I really wanted to lay out both why it's necessary, why it's not happening, and see if we can start to think about some steps to take to create that culture of innovation. And these are the four that I'll start with. So the first is around building intra-organisational collaboration. Now this is not just into organisation and breaking down those silos just for the fun of it and to have a sort of a kumbaya moment but really around the valuing the diversity of thinking that comes from cross-functional teams. And in my conversations with councils and presenting to different councils, what's been really interesting is that councils are a microcosm of so many different uh, skill sets and uh, perspectives, because in many ways you have a whole range of uh, occupations under the one roof. And so what that, what that means is you can actually really build in that cross-functional teams can deliver probably better than your average professional services organisation where people have generally got similar skill sets. So there, there is a real opportunity for that intra-organisational collaboration and there are different ways to go about it. It could be through any initiatives where there, there is an encouragement, whether it's the social activities but also innovation circles where there's a very deliberate encouragement of cross-functional teams, people from different uh, parts of the business to work together. The second key to creating a culture of innovation is to adopt the mindset to start small and iterate. And again, seems quite um, uh, straightforward, but it actually goes against many of the things that are embedded in a government organisation. As the OECD pointed out in a um, piece around innovation, that was that administration, administrative systems are purposely designed to, for stability, to um, ensure accountability, uh, to, to make things secure. Of course, the systems are actually not designed for flexibility, for nimbleness and for adapting. And so in order to create an culture of innovation there's probably four key things and one is to really there's no you you can't have a mistake free learning environment and if i reflect on some of the cultural things here within blue chili um around um do first ask for forgiveness later sort of a, a real empowerment of people to recognize that you know if you're going to take if you're going to do things big you're going to probably um, need to think outside of what's normally been done. So how do you make that possible for people to test ideas in a fail safe way or to test them in a small way so that the failures can be quickly recognised and, and, and you can adjust accordingly? The second one would be around you've got to celebrate the early wins and certainly um, some simple changes within the organisation can start to breed this culture of innovation. One of the things that I find really interesting is um, switching up meeting formats. And I, again, notice that here, um, but also the way in which staff are engaged. For example, um, you know, it might be constant uh, engagement with staff around the the mood, the atmosphere within the organisation, that constant engagement means that you've got much better data. Or it could be something that is um, facing the citizens around consultation processes. It could be a change in the way that's done. But early, start small, doesn't need to be a massive um, change to the organisation. Start where start where you can. And, and really utilise the word why. Why do we do it like this? Why is it not possible why have we why are we still why does it take this long um, and the final one is around seeking feedback regularly at the end of most projects that happen in a software organization there will be a retrospective on what worked and what didn't work and this blew my mind how regularly this happens um, and it 
and it's such a such a simple thing to do and yet it's probably done on a um, two to three week basis and it really is around that constant feedback loop and it means that you always feel comfortable sharing feedback so third step I see as creating a culture of innovation is the whole concept of co-creation now whether that's with with uh, vendors or people that you're working in that are providing services into government or whether citizens co-creation is uh, a critical part of understanding the problem much more closely and developing better solutions together we have a saying in in uh, blue chili and, and it's very uh, standard sort of lean startup saying around goob hashtag goob g o o b get out of the building get out of the building in order to understand the problem better you've got to talk to your you've got to talk to your customers talk to your suppliers understand the problems better and then you can develop better solutions and the last one usually it's something people go to first oh we can't have a culture of innovation without leadership and it does it requires leadership but there are also initiatives that staff can take and 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 staff can be encouraged to uh, bring ideas that to um, and there can be tools that staff can use as well it certainly does help with leaders um, on board and, and leading the charge and what I've seen in in councils in Australia that are particularly leading in innovation and uh, uh, Ed mentioned Newcastle and, and creating that entrepreneurial spirit within the council. It, it it requires at all levels, and that is at the political level, but also within the within the leadership of the organisation, and also infusing that down throughout the organisation. So it's interesting when we talk about a culture of innovation. A distinction is made sometimes between a healthy culture of innovation and a thriving culture of innovation. And I guess to take the organisation and and if you're thinking, you know, those four things are easy. We've already done that. To take it to the next level, there's probably three more things that can happen. And this is certainly from the perspective of working with startups critical elements to finding um, progressive and leading councils that are doing um, and are willing to uh, and open to trying new things. Designating a living lab or demonstration site is a, a really healthy way and, a, and a, um, a way to fast track a culture of innovation if it's alongside those other things that I just mentioned, the other four. And that is because it allows you to say, certainly in this area, there's we shouldn't be saying no. We should we should be finding ways. If there is a solution that we could try in this in this development or in this part of in this redevelopment or um, with this new uh, building, if there is an opportunity to try something new, we should be. The next one is around building internal capabilities, and I know um, you know if we. Uh, Certainly Lillian, uh, I was looking at her credentials and her background, certainly understanding the data analytics and some of those internal capabilities within an organisation. Um, it really will take an organisation to an, the next level because they're able to actually with internally use evidence to inform decisions on a daily basis. And I think at this point, we've got a lot of um, service providers that are needed to help us with the analysis of data but to the extent that those capabilities can be built internally that will certainly help infuse and, and create a thriving culture of innovation and the last one and you might think that of course I'm going to say this working for a startup uh, incubator accelerator is that it's necessary to work with startups but I say this for a really important reason uh, the startups will have a number of benefits to working with them First of all, they've generally got a story that your citizens are going to be more um, open to hearing. If they hear about a great new tech solution that's from a, um, a large provider, maybe a multinational, and they just hear um, about the solution, they'll probably think it's expensive and perhaps even it's got some uh, 
security, cybersecurity challenges with it. If there is a solution that comes to you from someone who, in, who just oozes that passion for the problem, they really believe that this is a problem that they want to, they want to drop everything. Running a startup is hard and they want to drop everything to run a startup that addresses this problem. That's a much easier story to communicate to uh, to your citizens that um, that's why you're working with this organisation because they want to solve the problem. And there's a couple of other things. They've generally got um, much greater knowledge of the local circumstances, and they're certainly they startups live and die by the by their ability to adapt to what the customer needs, and so. They're going to be very much in tune with you, with your needs, but you're also going to see how they operate, and that's where working with startups can also can be very much a two way street. So there are some really great startups um, in the city space, and these are just um, these have actually all uh, developed in the last year. Um, Blue Chile is working with each of these, and I think as you look through here, noise and air quality mapping, there's um, insights into the social identity of neighbourhoods, SciGround looking at transforming public spaces into science playgrounds, uh, Smart Link looking at um, transparency around um, uh, developer contributions and Civic Switchboard are in that very important place around understanding how um, government and community communicate to one another. So. These are some of the Blue Chili startups, but obviously there's a lot more in the space. We've seen some great um, organisations that uh, are growing rapidly because they've been really in tune with those customer needs. Um, the Internet of Things Alliance certainly has highlighted the success of Rico as an IoT integration platform. Uh, the Water Group is uh, water sensing. Um, Meshed obviously doing fantastic stuff around the country and, and spot parking, a really interesting model, um, really changing the way in which doing audits of, of parking um, availability and, and parking uh, types in a city. All of these startups will argue that their, that their solutions are able to be adopted in a way that is much more in tune with the organisation, but also probably at a lot, a lot lower cost than um, has been anticipated previously. And, and, and for that reason, um, I'm really passionate about the role of startups working to create that culture of innovation. I guess where I've finished with, and it, and it might seem a bit trite, but I think um, it's really important to, to think about if all those sort of seven things that I've mentioned before seem um, too hard, there's one very simple thing to, to infuse a culture of innovation, and that's really changing language. And th there's certainly language that can kill innovation. In fact, this is just one example. If you Google something innovation killers or idea killers, there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, <laughs> diagrams and memes around it. But there's so many ways to kill an idea in an organisation and I think um, if I can sort of really al alert you to those those things that um, you just do not, do not hear in an, um, and, and I haven't heard any of these this year and it, I think it's um, being outside of government but also being in an organisation that really wants to embrace doing things better and cheaper and faster and always looking for improvements. And what that means is when you hear something or when there's a discussion to really focus on what I like about that is, and really that should be the first um, response instead of um, some of those other things that can kill the, kill the conversation. And that's all from me. That's Happy great. Jane. There's, a, there's a lot of information there, but but also some very good tools and a very um, almost systematic way to go through this. But one of the things that um, you know I find interesting um, is about confidence and um, and getting organisations confident to to try something. Um, 
and I and I just don't know whether you've had some examples where there has been you know a city government that it's just just knowing where to start yeah. and getting that and starting small as you said just to get oh actually it's not so hard or it's okay if we don't get it perfect each time to get that particular confidence in there um, and I don't know even Ed whether you've got yeah. some examples around that thing and I think that the biggest thing, problem is the boss in most of these situations where the boss is uh, maybe not seen overtly, but covertly that everything has to come through me. And I think the smart organizations are the ones that get small. And this is something I try to teach people all the time. You don't need to know what we're involved in every single little decision. Let the organization grow small, not big. What do you think about that, Joanne? Yes, certainly. I think um, this is, it's almost like the distributed de decision making and empowering staff. What's really interesting is organisations where there is that sort of gateway mentality that all, all decisions come through me, is it's incredibly disempowering. And you certainly won't keep staff um, motivated, if at all, um, if where there is that, where there, there is that sort of um, culture and I think particularly in organizations where there may be a, a number of people that have long um, have been with an organization for a long time there also becomes a bit of tenure bias and um, that can also be interpreted as ageism that that those with more more experience certainly know better and um, one of the most important things around empowering staff is the sort of idea that you know what everyone's got a valid position here and um, that particularly in organizations where there is an where there is a challenge keeping um, and attracting younger staff that it is about um, encouraging junior staff to really put forward ideas as much as anyone else and that no one has a monopoly on that that sort of idea creation aspect now that's absolutely right and we need more people with more ideas uh, one of the things I found really interesting was in Boston, uh, the, the city hackathons. And so the city trying to come up with an answer to a problem, it's city put they on every Saturday, they organize a group of people with their computers, they come in, have all access to the data, get formed into teams, and they try to find the answer as a community rather than the city saying, oh, here's how we're going to sweep the streets. Mm. Yeah, so there's, there's some problem really problem everyone is really important. Yeah, there's some really interesting examples. Um, in the same way that citizen science is about engaging people in what's going around, citizen democracy and really um, but then also contributing to the analysis of data is a, a really great way to leverage people with different skill sets. One of the challenges I've seen with hackathons, and I'm, uh, I've organised, I think, five this year, so I'm a, I'm a big believer in the value of them, but they sometimes get sidelined as a bit of innovation theatre. And yes, there's true. sometimes a bit of a sense that, you know, let's do a hackathon and we'll come up with great ideas and then everything will be solved. Whereas I feel like the value of a hackathon and getting back to the point of intra organizational collaboration and creating those links across silos is the value of a hackathon is getting people together that would never normally work together they're working in a kind of pressure test pressure tested environment and um, they're trying new things and I really also like where hackathons have some people with great tech skills and some people who have other skills and whether that's on the ground experience with delivery of services or maybe it's project management experience or um, some other, maybe it might even be design experience, they're pretty creative. Um, it's, it's about the mix of skills that's really important. And so a hackathon I see as a means to an end and the means is really important is, and, and, and what that end is, is cultural change. It's not about the solutions. The solutions, if there are good solutions that come from a hackathon, that's an absolute bonus. But that's not the focus. And um, I think uh, Hackathons Australia always um, lists all the hackathons around the country. And I can't speak highly enough about the benefit to um, 
at, in personal growth from participating in hackathons. And that's if the city is really there and the community is there that's going to implement the decision. There's no sense in having this if the city's already made up its mind or the people in charge don't really want any new information. It's, it's the culture that we're talking about here, not the tool. Yeah, exactly. And the, and the city will decide, if the city puts it on, that's already se sending a very important message that they care about co-creation, that they care about bringing out new ideas. Then the next step is to what extent are they, are they sharing information to make that hackathon a success or to make that um, event a success? Um, whether that's data, do they have an open data um, policy and, and do they have a culture of sharing data and making data accessible? And then to what extent are they sharing knowledge about the challenges that they face? Um, I think often uh, it's, it's easy to sort of be quiet about what the challenges are, whereas in fact sharing the challenges and sharing the really difficult trade-offs that are, need to be made every day in, in government really um, very much help citizens appreciate the challenges that government faces. Absolutely. Uh, one idea that um, we're beginning to implement here is several cities, because they were amalgamated, have found that it's very good to bring people from the various organizations together in a learning lab. Uh, so they learn some new things about other places and get excited about the future of a place they're co-creating, as it were. Uh, and I think going across local government boundaries or state boundaries to do the same thing really enlivens the staff and creates great opportunities. The tools aren't important, but the idea is the tools help you spread that communication uh, they're not a means, uh, they're only a means, they're not the end. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it's probably the big regret of all the amalgamation discussions and, and no doubt incredibly challenging to be on the inside of organisations that are going through an organisational change and, and restructures and there's so much negative about that process and yet there's so much positive that could be um, come from it as well and so taking the best of how one organization does it and how another organization does it, melding the best of, of each and um, really learning from each other different ways. That, that's the op opportunity that exists there. And I, and I think to the extent that um, councils that are amalgamating have been able to do that, that's really, um, you know, finding that silver lining in all of that um, difficulty in, uh, of amalgamating. But there are opportunities there and um, recently speaking with one amalgamated council and it was uh, um, the purpose, of the reason uh, Blue Chili was brought in to speak to them was because it was sort of starting afresh, creating a new baseline of what a culture of innovation will look like and that was about bringing people together and putting them on the same page but then also learning from each other. So um, the amalgamation certainly creates that opportunity, um, albeit, it, you know, it's very difficult on individuals who are involved, but it can be leveraged in that way. I just got an, another one I'd like your opinion on. Uh, we're running out of burial space. <laughs> and I think it's a great opportunity to go out to the community and say, how do we deal with this rather than saying, how do we buy more ground? Uh, there may be other ways to solve that problem. We are an aging population. That's right. That's <laughs> right. And uh, uh, but that's a serious problem. And clearly, there are cultural issues here and the like. But the kind of linear thinking is we're going to find more space to bury people is not, probably not the way to go go about it. That's it, exactly. And I, I recall when that was um, at the state government being investigated and kind of what what to do. Um, but certainly that's prime, that's a prime topic for changing human behavior, changing human preferences, um, before thinking about finding more land. And just recently I was in uh, Barcelona for the World uh, Smart Cities Congress and one of the most striking things about the Barcelona um, uh, cityscape for me was the, the way in which they'd um, arranged their their 
cemetery as being stacked into the mountainside. Most beautiful thing ever seen. It was the most picturesque um, cemetery. So there's certainly um, lots of ways to go about it. And it is about, and that would be a perfect topic to think about how do we incentivize uh, different decisions, but also um, think about doing things a little bit differently. Yeah, one of the things um, I know we've talked about before, it, but you've mentioned today as well, is that the getting that cross organisation um, collaboration and almost thinking about innovation. You know, you cannot do it in a single cell in one part of the organisation if it's not connected with others. And particularly when it comes to financing a project or providing you know, that financial backing to, to get an idea going. And the procurement process is one that's usually a very linear and a very long process. Um, whereas the sorts of things that you've talked about today around starting small, try it, don't don't worry about it. if you fail this time, you can pick up next time. You know, I'm not sure if that's actually aligned to what you very often see is a, a long linear procurement process within councils. I don't know if you've had some thoughts about how, how councils can perhaps change or realign that to more of an innovative entrepreneurial culture. And socially responsible. And so, yeah, yeah. To bring in minority groups, teenagers, and others uh, in the procurement process. Mm. Yeah, the, um, a part of me loves the procurement challenge and um, certainly wearing my sort of public policy hat, I love to think about how would you change it? How could you change it? And then the other part of me just says it, it freaks me out. It's too big. Um, it's really difficult. And it's really, it's um, important to get right and, um, the downside of having a process that is perceived or actually um, not open and fair and transparent is is really that's a really big risk to to work with. So, I guess the latest thing I've been um, thinking about in that area is about having um, certainly using the living lab and demonstration site to um, make certain areas um, exempt from the usual procurement requirements. Um, and that sort of gives it, cordons it off. Also thinking about how do you create a baseline of OHS um, requirements that must be passed so that even if you are not going through a full procurement process, you still have to meet certain OHS um, guidelines so that um, personal safety and st safety of staff is paramount um, without killing the innovation and killing the opportunity. So an example I can uh, share with you, um, it's not one of the startups I mentioned here that I'm not working with councils at the moment, but Banjo Maps provides uh, internal navigation for the visually impaired and they have a pilot site at UTS. And um, one of the most important enablers of that pilot site, and there were lots of people that made it possible, but was the person who operated the forklift and he was, you know, happy to, you know, move around the building to um, post these beacons, their sort of IoT devices in different places. That would have been very easy to say no. Uh, at the same time, he made an assessment of what what it was going to take and he assessed that it was that he could he could make it work with the forklift that he was using or whatever. And in many cases, I think procurement can be a big barrier, but it can also be things that are not procurement that are barriers as well. So someone could just say, no, we don't have the ability to put the beacons up there that it's too high, we can't do it. But this person said, no, we can do it. We can do it safely if I get the forklift, this forklift, scissor lift, and made it possible. So a part of me thinks procurement's really hard to tackle and so it's gonna take time. And the, the other part and why I love this topic so much that, and I'm so pleased you sort of made it one of the topics for this series, is that there are a lot of other things that you can do to make innovation possible before tackling procurement and almost hiding behind the procurement barriers really um, is kind of the problem. We can, we can find ways and we can experiment 
um, piloting, co-creating, using a living lab sort of scenario, we can pilot things on a very small scale and then if necessary, go to a procurement process. But it's going to be tough to challenge and, and change those procurement guidelines. So in the meantime, how, do, how what are other ways to create a culture of innovation? There's an expectation of an innovation. You'll get it. Uh, when I was in the Air Force, um, one of the things that our commanders did, and I have no idea why they did, was had a weekly innovation prize. Uh, and uh, the ideas that came in, some of them were very simple, but improved our safety, improved our takeoff times, all that kind of stuff, just by having a culture that every week we're going to have a, a prize. Uh, and uh, I won it once for a lockable door uh, <laughs> on an aircraft that was having all kinds of trouble. Everybody just had the same trouble with it. And I just figured out how to lock the darn door. Uh, yeah. But, you know, when you're a part of a group that is innovating, you want to innovate, right? And that's what we need to start building in our culture here, particularly in any large organization. Smaller organizations are more nimble, but when you get above 10 people, all of a sudden rules come in that overshadow innovation. Yeah, yeah. And there's not an expectation to innovate. The expectation is to stay where you are. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. And you think, and yet you think in the military, one of the largest organizations, if they can do it, then other organizations should be able to do it. And I know the military has actually sort of created some really interesting cultural um, norms around empowering people to make decisions because they say within these guidelines, you are empowered to make decisions about that. And so they've, they've actually sort of um, done the distributed sort of um, delegation of authority that, that makes that possible. And another example would be uh, with the Australian Navy, they certainly adopted 3D printers on all their ships. And, and at first it took me a while to understand why that was so important, but it's because, you know, with mission critical timing, actually be able to produce the, the widget that just broke when you're in the middle of um, the ocean is really important. And so, adopting that and rewarding that and incentivizing people to speak up is so important. And I guess it's why I really think that the sort of final slide where it, it's, you know, let's hear the idea first and let's let's really celebrate what what we can do with it. And um, yeah, I think I think that's a really important part of a culture of innovation is encouraging regular, regularly people to think of new ways of doing things. Yeah, I, I just want to add two more things. One of them is I think it's important if you're going to have an innovative culture to shake up the organization a bit every once in a while. Move people around uh, because the longer you stay in a place, the more comfortable you get. Now, that's not true for everything. I don't know if I want to move the accountants around, but there's so many people in organizations who only see one part of it. And a large organization I go to regularly has this incredible depot with all kinds of great people and stuff. And I'm talking to them about the rest of the city and they don't know anything about it. They don't know how the other parts of the city operate. I find that almost ridiculous. Here are the guys who are moving the trash, moving the goods and so forth. And they don't know how important parts of the city even operate. They've never even been to a city council meeting. They have no idea of, uh, you know, how the big projects in the cities are being done. They're building big buildings and things. And to them, they're just moving trash. Uh, I think it's really a shame when you don't have a learning organization as well as an innovation organization. Yeah, and they're, they're really two sides of the same coin. So um, a, an ability to learn with the you know, with um, without eliminating failure and, and risk is, is so important. One of the a really simple thing that um, an organization, uh, we do similar things here at Blue Chili, but it was actually a previous organization would do interchange, which was um, on a single day, instead of, 
you know, going to training courses or mentoring or whatever, you would spend half a day with someone doing their job and they would spend half a day with you doing your job. And it was really interesting. And the more different a person you selected for your interchange, you got to choose whoever you wanted, um, the more interesting the day was. So that example that you gave around maybe it's people um, in in parks or in um, in the waste area, they, you know, actually working with them for half a day to see what their reality is and then for them to see what your reality is, I think that actually would, it, it just changes your understanding of what pressures they are under and, and, and to really live that. And it's really at a very low expense to the organisation. So it's essentially shadowing someone for half a day. And, they, and I, I, I found that an incredibly helpful experience. Yeah, I think organizations need to do a lot more of that. The uh, the people who are sweeping the streets spend a half a day in the child mm. care center. Mm. Uh, sure, they like kids, but they don't know what goes on in a child care center, why it's just so important to have the lines in the right place and the parking bays in the right place and that sort of thing. We've compartmentalized so many things that people who do them just do them out of rote when they could add something to it. They could change the parking space for a handicapped person but they're not thinking about that. They're just doing their job, as they say. Yeah. Or, yeah. I'm just conscious of time, Johanna, and we've, we've got you talking a fair bit, so I I'm very much appreciate that, but there's um, probably a good gap there. Unless you want to have a final comment, I'm more than happy for you to jump in if you'd like. No, that was, um, yeah, no, I really um, enjoyed and, and sort of discussing that around the different opportunities we have and, and learning and creating that culture of learning and also culture in, of innovation. I think that goes really hand in hand. So I think that's a really nice way to um, to wrap it up. Yeah, and I think it has been interesting. I know that all of us and many people on the line is you know, very passionate about their community and passionate about their organisation. And I guess the, the overarching take out from today is that there, ha there needs to be that cultural shift um, where I think you get that confidence and you try and you get that capability, then you can actually still be in the driver's seat and um, and not have technology lead you, but you lead technology and you can get such a plethora of ideas um, that are out there within your organisation or within the community and actually really start to work hand in hand with the community to get some things done. Because I know this year has been a big year for everybody and even um, today getting a lot of um, information there. But um, but as I've said uh, on previous occasions, you know, there are four cornerstones to being a smart city. One of them, which I think I think is one of the most important, is the culture of innovation. But there's also information in the data, how we use the urban data that's around us and how we collect it, how we share it. And that innovation culture is part of that mix as well how we finance and fund those ideas that we might have, but also how we engage the community and deliver the customer services that we know we need be, um, and we know we should be delivering um, for our city and for our community. And, the, and, and those are not siloed. They're I, definitely not they silos. cross over one another, they're integrated, yeah. and you have to be living them, breathing them, and doing them all the time. Yeah, exactly. And so from a city's leadership perspective, I just wanted to say thank you to all the listeners out there. Thank you to, to you, Johanna, for being part of our discussion today. Um, I'm sure we'll hear and see more of you um, next year and more of the people online next year. The city's leadership will continue to work with the federal government in smart cities, but smart cities is definitely just about cities full stop um and getting them to work for our communities so i wish all um the best of the season and all the best of the year ahead thank you everybody for joining us and we'll be smarter next year yeah done take care thank you thank you